All right, why don't we, uh, ooh, that microphone's hot. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, it's good. Uh, hopefully they'll get the audio started. I don't think I have to wait for any cues for the, for the audio being recorded. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know there's a lot of competition for the hour, so I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm Matt Westgate. Uh, if, you're in the if you're in the room to listen to the virtual company talk, you're in the right place. Uh, I am uh, a co-founder and president of Lullabot, a company that was started in 2006. The reason I'm giving this talk is because we uh, are a distributed company of about 35 people, and so we've made a lot of mistakes over the years, uh, and I get to share uh, some of those pain points and, and hopefully some of the, a lot of the resolutions uh, along the way with you as well. So a little bit of background. Uh, I've been with the Drupal community for about nine years. I actually knew of Drupal uh, for about 10 years or so, but I first went there, saw a scary floating alien head with a tagline, community plumbing, and quickly ran the other way. <laughs> it was not a very sexy platform. Uh, however, I went back after frustrations with uh, Joomla and the like. Uh, that was shiny on the inside, but a little bit uh, <laughs> less on the interiors, and uh, started to look at the source code of Drupal. And what I saw in particular, uh, this was about Drupal 4.1, um, it, they were touting the node system, they were touting the node architecture, and in particular, uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Wittens wrote this manifesto uh, of the node system, and I absolutely fell in love with it from a source code perspective. Uh, I looked under the hood, and Drupal to me was like reading poetry. Um, the comments outweighed the code, and I quickly realized that I was surrounding myself with people that I was really excited to be with, uh, and it was empowering to think that there were individuals solving the same kinds of problems that I was trying to figure out on my own. I think my story is pretty similar to a lot of developers in the room in that you start rolling your own code and, uh, you know, hooray, I created a way for users to log in, and so has every other CMS. And then you keep going along, and I've created a blogging platform, and so has every other CMS. And you realize, um, you know, with the 10 clients you have, the 20 clients you have, the 30 clients you have, that you're stuck not implementing new features, but just fixing the same bugs and uh, doing maintenance tasks over and over again. Uh, so joining Drupal, being a part of that community, was an important step uh, in eventually how Lullabot formed. Uh, my uh, initial involvement was in the e-commerce project, the original e uh, implementation of the e-commerce platform, uh, and it was scary as hell to contribute. Uh, it was also exciting and delicious to contribute. Um, there was, there was a, a, a lot of encouragement and peer support from day one in the project, and that'll come in. Uh, that'll be an important aspect uh, for my talk later on. So I got started with Drupal in about 2002, 2003. And in October of 2005, I was at a crossroads where I had a, a job working for the university, um, building Drupal sites for a, a lot of my clients. But there was also a lot of magic happening elsewhere. Uh, I had uh, found Jeff Robbins, or more, more so Jeff had found me. Uh, and we started working on some Drupal projects together. Uh, and I posted this blog entry, uh, and I said, I never thought I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. I'm at work in my underwear, pillow marks on my face, and writing a blog entry. Yep, I'm a Drupal freelancer now. Um, and that was the beginning uh, of, um, I'd, I'd hate to overstate it and say a movement in Drupal, but I wasn't the only one. And shortly thereafter, uh, a guy by the name of Moshe Weitzman, who you may know, uh, he sent an email out to, the, to a couple of the Drupal folks saying, hey everybody, uh, inspired by Matt, I'm also leaving my full-time job and taking on more Drupal work. Uh, and more and more uh, Drupal core contributors, there was, about, there was about 60 or 90 sort of hardcore contributors at that time started taking on uh, freelance work, started quitting their day jobs and doing more Drupal work. Um, around that time, there, there was a, a pivotal moment for me where I was talking with Jeff in the background, 
Uh, and we were working on a project together, and uh, uh, I got to fly to California and work out of the Adaptive Path offices, because that was a project that Jeff and I was working on uh, for them. And they kept telling us, you guys should start a company. You guys should start a company. So we kind of looked at each other and said, maybe, maybe we should start a company. Uh, so in 2006, the beginning of 2006, I sent direct Idris an email. And I said, I wanted to let you know about a company Jeff Robbins and myself are forming and how I think it will benefit the Drupal community. Our company name is Lullabot, and our goal is to provide consulting, education, and development using Drupal. Now, at this time, both Jeff and I had been involved in Drupal for a number of years. There was no concept of a physical office. There was no concept of, uh, you know, Drupal was the best example of how to work in a distributed environment. And I'd go on to say that anybody working in open source software kind of has that mojo already going for them. You're working as a distributed team. You have the passion and the fights that go along with it. You uh, have to build collaboration tools that get out of the way and let you get your job done. Uh, it was a real source of inspiration for Jeff and I. And we didn't even think about a physical company. Um, really, we just wanted to hire our friends in the community and keep doing kick-ass Drupal work. So this Drupal, the Drupal community showed us that it was possible to work as a distributed team. Um, I'm going to take it one step further and say it also showed us that Drupal is a social network, right? That it's a way to communicate and collaborate uh, in lieu of being physically together. Uh, and um, I'd even take it one step further when I look at distributed companies, when I look at virtual companies, and say that your company is a social network. Uh, that, uh, you know, being a distributed company, you have to come together in a lot of different ways. You have to recreate a lot of the um, things that a physical company has. The water cooler, coming into work, saying hi to your team, doing more than just getting work done. Uh, and uh, I find that these patterns over and over again uh, are, sort of the, are sort of the cultural glue, not only for the Drupal community, but for uh, how distributed communities work as well, or distributed companies work as well. So I want to approach this from some of the common questions that we get uh, about uh, a distributed company. Uh, and I, I put five of them down that we're going to go through. So the first one is there's no way that you can be a real company. How on earth can you do that? Uh, we're going to take a look at that. Uh, communication is inefficient, tedious. Uh, there's no teamwork. How do you get things done collaboratively? It's a lonely job. What about the uh, isolation? And there's no way it's sustainable. At some point, uh, it's just all going all gonna to fall apart. <laughs> so let's take the first one. How can you be a real company? Um, it, it is a little more difficult, but it's not impossible. Uh, so this is, from the lovely folks of Wikipedia, a concept project called Crystal Island. Uh, it's a, it's a, a potential build taking place in Moscow, Russia, Russia and it's scheduled to be uh, the biggest physical um, man-made structure on Earth, um, currently on hold. Uh, uh, but this is, this is a, an interesting example of a physical company. Uh, I think the term physical company came about uh, as a sort of anti-movement against uh, internet-based companies. So, you know, before physical companies, there was the brick and mortar companies, right? Uh, uh, and brick and mortar companies define themselves when the whole mail order catalog movement came about. Uh, so um, now, uh, you know, now physical companies, you can think of um, like Blockbuster versus Netflix. Uh, I guess that's not <laughs> relevant anymore. Um, what about uh, uh, um, Amazon versus Border Books? Oh, that's not relevant either. Um, maybe physical companies is, needs to be less of a distinction uh, than, it has, than it has before. Because um, what I'm finding is that never before has geographic location mattered less for the type of work that we do. Uh, and and I, I, think that, uh, I think that we're only going to see more and more uh, virtual companies uh, crop up. So some other types of companies. You have the physical company with virtual employees. Um, we, have a, we have a saying 
uh, in Lullabot. Uh, and it's a little bit harsh, <laughs> but we say um, a physical company with virtual employees tends to be a physical company with alienated employees because there's things that are happening in the office. There's culture that's happening in that physical workspace uh, that doesn't get translated out or communicated out to the team. Now, you may have road warriors, uh, that people that travel all the time, where it, does, it, it, it matters a little bit less because they're always out there doing their thing. But for the most part, what we see is a lot of alienation uh, when you have to bridge that gap between a physical company and a, uh, a team of virtual employees. Uh, a virtual company, so there's a lot of distinction between, um, uh, uh, so I don't like the phrase virtual. <laughs> um, I don't like the phrase virtual employees. I don't like the phrase virtual company, uh, and I wish it would kind of just go away. Um, virtual somehow implies that you don't exist uh, or that uh, it's not real in some way. Um, we are. We are real. These are real people. These are real companies. Uh, and uh, I much prefer uh, uh, looking at it from a different lens that I'll talk about in a moment. You'll also see this, this phrase, virtual workers, crop up. And um, just to be clear, th that's a movement uh, where companies are cutting their workforce and outsourcing a bunch of freelancers to get the work done. There was a, a, a latest article uh, about Caterpillar, uh, and they hired 30,000 freelance workers to replace a majority of their work staff because they could play them uh, part-time and on an hourly basis. Uh, that's also not what we're talking about here. So what do you call a company with no central office and employees spread out across, across the globe? I think it needs, it needs a new name. Um, and I'm not the, the first one to come up with this name. Um, but I like, to, I like to call it distributed company uh, with distributed employees. Uh, the first, the first uh, ones to come up with this name is the, is the folks at Automatic. Uh, they refer to their team. They are a completely distributed team of about 150 people. And they uh, lovingly, lovingly refer to their company as a distributed company. Um, so I think as soon as you hire an employee beyond one company or beyond one country, uh, you're a distributed company. Uh, and Lullabot, for instance, and this, this is the irony, um, we can legally hire employees in the U.S., in Canada, uh, in Denmark, and the United Kingdom. And we're working on a couple other countries, too. But the irony is that in order to be a distributed company, we had to have a physical presence in those countries. <laughs> so uh, there's all sorts of... Um, caveats in gray areas that you're going to run up against. Uh, being a, a country, or being a, a company in a single area, in a single um, country, so just being a US-based company makes things a lot easier. And oftentimes, um, what organizations do is they'll have US employees and then have freelancers uh, for the outside, for outside the US. Uh, that works up into a point. And that point is, is, is when you're, you know, depending on them for a daily basis, then the IRS may have uh, other opinions about that. And at first, that's how Lullabot started. But then we had to make the switch as the majority, a, a larger majority of our workforce um, happened, happened overseas. So another thing is about expenses. Uh, it's, it's cheaper at first, that's for sure. You don't have to rent a building or, or buy a building. But it's, it, it all washes out in the end. I mean, to do it, to do it right costs money. And there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot of overhead that goes into um, running a company. You know, a, a lot of people say, uh, uh, I have a saying about open source software, and that you don't go with open source software to save money. That's, that's a good tagline at the beginning, um, but the reason you go with open source software is for the freedom and control and flexibility and to create something that's, that's your own. Um, you know, what you don't pay for in upfront costs, you eventually pay for in human resources, right? To, to build a team, to take it to the place that you wanna go. Uh, it's the same, 
I think it's, it's quite a bit the same with a distributed company. Uh, you know, you, you pay for the people, you pay for the culture, uh, and you pay less for uh, the brick and mortar components of your organization. There, there is a lot of travel. Uh, the, there's, you know, you will, you will pay for travel costs. At, at some, uh, some points in Lullabot's history, we had a travel agent. Uh, um, thanks to things like TripIt uh, and other, and other uh, online tech services that became uh, less of a need, but you still need someone to uh, wrangle it and organize it. Um, and you do find uh, a lot of travel. And we do meetups. We get together with smaller groups of our team. Uh, we also have a, an annual retreat that we do. Um, but it's good, it's good to get together. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about that, too, uh, in a little bit. Um, so as, as you can tell, with all of these, <laughs> with all of these resources, you kind of need uh, what we call a HR superhero. superhero. It's a lot easier if you stay in a single country uh, and hire contractors, but uh, still you're dealing with all sorts of state laws, all sorts of country laws. Um, it'll melt your brains thinking about all the things uh, that you have to take into consideration. Health insurance, disability, life insurance, 401k, uh, writing things down, your, your culture, your values, uh, birthday cards, gift certificates, all of those sorts of things. Uh, HR is probably, it's, it's one of the most important management roles I think that a uh, distributed organization can have. Um, also, there's Wikipedia, which is crazy helpful in this regard. Uh, so uh, leave it up to the, uh, the, the, the global uh, Wikipedians uh, to document uh, all of the uh, facts about parental leave uh, and make a nice little table for you to go through. Uh, or to uh, talk about uh, which countries allow vacation time and how much and, and what you need to account for. Um, one note about health insurance. There's some new laws that are coming into effect uh, that uh, say for um, a U.S. organization to offer health insurance, 51% of its employees have to be employed within that state. Uh, that, that bit us in the butt uh, probably about six months ago. We had to switch states uh, in order to maintain our health insurance. Uh, and United Healthcare is one that tends to be more general about that than other organizations. But again, it is that thing that in order to be a distributed organization, you may have to establish a physical presence in a, com in a, in a state uh, that doesn't have um, this, this restriction. Um, but we need to keep an eye on this, because uh, it's probably going to come up again. Uh, and we need to, we need to communicate uh, that there is a growing workforce uh, that um, is working differently than other typical organizations um, work. So management style in a distributed company. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you read Daniel Pink's book, Drive, Motivation 3.0? Not many people have read it. I see a couple nods. Um, so he talks, about, he talks about three components uh, for motivation. Uh, he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, and I think that's the best way that I can sum up uh, a management style where you effectively can't micromanage, right? There has to be... Uh, some trust and openness because it's inherently built into the structure. Um, but autonomy is your team wants to have control over their work. Um, and I think as managers, our role is to inspire, to empower, and to facilitate collaboration. Um, besides, you can't, you can't lord over them anyway. Um, they're, they're working from their own home. Uh, so uh, openness and autonomy is, a, is an important component. Mastery, people want to get better at what they do and they want to learn from each other. Um, we have uh, a saying in Lullabot of asking the hive mind. <laughs> and uh, the idea behind it is that we're all pretty tapped in into what each other is working on and we have ways to ask a question to the entire team uh, not only do we have that, but we also have sort of a group chat running all the time where we can ping each other and ask questions, bounce ideas off each other and get feedback, and creating a culture where that's, that's inherent into, into the organization um, really meets that motivation 3.0 uh, qualification. 
and also purpose, right? People want to be a part of something that's bigger than just themselves. Uh, you know, they want to shift from the I to the we space. Uh, you know, it's, it's why I got involved in Drupal. Uh, you know, look what, look what we can do together rather than just me as an individual. Uh, I think at some point the shift will also go from, uh, and this is a little bit zenny, I apologize for that, that's my Buddhist background, um, but it'll go from the we to us, right, to all of us. What can we do and what purposes are we aligning with that's just, that's just bigger than the organization. Um, and for us, contributing back to Drupal uh, fills, that, fills that need for us uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but in order to do this work, it, in order for Motivation 3.0 to kind of happen, it needs to be ingrained in the culture. Uh, Jason Freed from 37 Signals, who uh, I take with a grain of salt at times, says culture is the byproduct of consistent behavior. Uh, and what that means to me is you need to live it, right? You need to practice what you preach. In a distributed company, I think it's lived through communication. It has to, you know, culture comes from the top down and you need to eat your own dog food with the way that you want to work. Uh, you know, you need to be the organization uh, that, you <laughs> that you want to be. So what I did is put together kind of a day in the life of, uh, you know, what it, what it looks like to be in a distributed organization. So the first thing we do is we go to work. You wake up, take a shower, grab your coffee, kiss your wife, feed the dog, uh, and head out. Out of the kitchen, upstairs, into your office, sit down, drink your coffee, open up the laptop, and log into IRC. Um, IRC is a, a group um, communication tool that we use. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's, it's sort of getting the ambient buzz for, uh, for the team, right? Uh, other people are logged in. You get to see who's at work. It's like, it's like showing up and opening the door and uh, punching, punching the time card. Um, so that's the first thing you do. Hop on to IRC, meet your team. Uh, then the next thing we do is we say, what's everyone up to? And for that, we use a, a tool called Yammer. It's kind of like private Twitter for business. It's a microblogging client uh, that we use. Um, and it's really changed the way uh, that we communicate with each other. Uh, we used to use an intranet. We used to have a site called The Daily Report back in the early days, where at the end of every day, we would type what we did and worked on and sort of communicated that and broadcasted that across the team. Now we use a more real-time communication, Yammer for that. So what are you working on this hour? What are you doing? What do you need help with? That sort of stuff. Um, notice that I haven't mentioned email yet. As often as possible, we try to go beyond the silos of email and bubble up the communication to uh, a, a more broadcast-based approach. Um, we use email for follow-up and a lot of client conversations. But otherwise, we try to bring things up into a more collaborative environment. So Google Docs, or we have an Etherpad installation running, which is like, you can think of it as Google Docs Lite without all of the formatting. Um, but uh, email, email tends to not be the first thing that we check in the morning. So you log on to email, or you log on to Yammer, uh, you go in, and today's topic, today's theme of the day is workstations. Everybody take pictures of your workstations, hooray! So now we're all going through, taking pictures of our workstations, going, holy crap, I didn't know you could do that. Wow, where did you get that monitor stand? That's totally cool. This is the, one of the uh, offices, uh, Lullabot offices, that usually remains empty except for meetups uh, and, uh, and uh, when we bring the team down uh, to, to collaborate. Um, there's a standard, standing desk, uh, Jared Ponshot's standing desk. Thanks, Jared. Um, and uh, and uh, everybody's just taking pictures of the, and we do this often. It's a great way. It's a great way to start the day. Uh, we uh, will say, "What's what do you, what's outside your window?" And everybody takes pictures of facial hair. Let's do facial, you know. And uh, it's just uh, it's a lot of fun to keep the keep the keep the work keep the fun moving along uh, on a on a day to day basis. Another great thing uh, about uh, a day in the life of of um, being a distributed employee is this distraction-free work. It's a different kind of mentality. Uh, uh, rather than 
the possibility of someone coming into your office or standing at your cubicle or, you know, it's, it's less disruptive. It's, it's, um, it's what we call the, the ping and pong culture from the IRC world uh, where you can turn uh, on your communication systems. You can also turn off your communication systems. You can also say that you're busy. Um, phone calls tend to be scheduled uh, rather than ad hoc uh, and, or otherwise we use we use IRC for communicating if someone's available for, um, to jump on the phone and, and, and have a conversation. So, you know, during this time, you're catching up on email, prepping for meetings, communicating with your team on various needs. Um, it, I, I tend to call it a mega collaboration environment. Um, for instance, you're getting ready for an interview, so you fire up a go-to meeting for a video conversation and usually for uh, our interviews, we'll have three or four people on. We'll have some lullabots and then the, uh, the uh, person that we're interviewing. Um, you know, meanwhile, you've got an Etherpad document open as a back channel, and you're taking, taking notes that the rest of the team is seeing uh, on this candidate. It's, it's a documentation culture, and you're always, the work that you're doing tends to be in a group mentality. It tends to be in a, in a broadcast nature. Um, because we need to share. We're, we, we are using the same communication tools. Um, most conversations happen in broadcast mode. You'll come up with phrases in your organization such as CC liberally. Uh, that's one that Jeff coined. And, and you know, the idea is, is that when you're emailing, loop other people in. Don't, don't go down into that silo effect because you're just going to have to tell the team about it sooner or later, uh, what's going on and what you're working on, what you're thinking about. Um, so you do the interview, after the call, let's say you go back uh, working on something that you're working on in Google Docs uh, and you know, start collaborating again. You don't have to get people on the phone to collaborate. You can uh, jump in and, and continue where you left off and someone may already be working on the thing that you're working on. You know, that's what's great about it. Um, you might want to listen to some music for a while. So we've got, of course, our own turntable room. Uh, we have, I think we have Jazz Music Wednesdays and. Uh, dance music Fridays, so you can uh, kick back, make some hits with the team. You know, all these things are really important from a cultural perspective, right? So then you go back, check Yammer again, and uh, uh, you get uh, comments like from Joe, uh, who's wrapping up, who's wrapping up his Fridays. These are real comments. Uh, he says, "Thanks for the fun week, everyone. You are more awesome than a cyborg cat wearing a tuxedo made out of bacon, riding on a unicorn with a lightsaber for a horn inside of a flaming space shuttle that is on track to orbit Mars." And then you refresh the screen, and holy crap, Sally Young just put a picture together of the whole damn thing. <laughs> Things like this happen often. Um, but, you know, the important part about this is, is culture, right, is, is ways to communicate and to collaborate uh, and it, it gets you out of, that, out of that silo mode. So some other things on uh, whether or not this is a real company or a real company model. Um, recruitment, how does recruitment work in a distributed company? You can, hire, you can hire the best of the best. You don't have to be confined to a specific geographic location. That was really important to us. Um, Drupal was a global project and we wanted to work with uh, people everywhere. Um, so, and oftentimes your best recruiting tools is the team itself, right? Saying to your team, help us create this culture, help us find the, the people that, that you want to work with. Uh, for, for instance, um, uh, there are a bunch of perks that come with being a distributed company. Uh, uh, and, uh, excuse me, uh, so distributed company comes with a different set of perks, right? There's no commute. There can be a commute if you want to, if you want to commute. You can co go to a co-working space or work with, you know, work with other, or put, get an office. Um, you have a personal work environment, which is nice. We actually saw pictures of that. Uh, more time with the family, flexible hours. Generally, a better work-life balance. Um, Again, this comes from the management and works down. Management sets and enforces this. If you uh, are working like crazy, you can expect your team to uh, essentially follow suit. Uh, we try to be conscientious on the weekends and, and use weekends for more inventing and hacking time uh, and leisurely kinds of, leisurely kinds of activities. Um, for recruitment, when it comes to 
things like vacation time and the such. Uh, we actually set expiration dates on our vacation time because we found if we didn't, that people don't take vacation, right? This is a lifestyle approach. You can take time off to go to the dentist. You can uh, you know, go, go to an exercise class in the middle of the day and then come back and work. And people wouldn't stop working. Uh, they, you know, you have to help enforce the boundaries there. Uh, and you gotta have time to recharge the batteries. And so we really try to enforce that. Um, but value, values-based hiring, right? Talking about those kinds, of, those kinds of things. And hiring for the company you want to be, uh, not always the company that you are. Uh, the, the aspirational kind of, of hiring. Um, is, is really important for, for the company culture. So what type of people thrive in a distributed company? Um, certainly, folks coming from the open source world, uh, you know, they have experience in a community. Uh, they have experience doing contributions and working as a team, kind of being in that we, we space. Um, it's really, really important. Comfort with the social media, you know, people that, uh, um, uh, like to broadcast uh, tends to be tends to be a big win. Strong written and verbal communication skills, um, obviously that's that's really important. The uh, um, written uh, and and spoken culture of a distributed company. You don't have the body language, right? Uh, you need to depend on these tools more. Um, hobbies, having hobbies, sports, family. Things that take you beyond the laptop really help with isolation. Uh, having, having activities to do and things outside of, of your day job um, are really sustaining uh, for that work-life work -life balance. So those are the kind of the things that, that we look for. Um, definitely the, the open source contributions are big because you can dive in. I mean, and that is, that is your resume. You can see the conversations that people are having uh, and use that as a good reference point. Retention, the weird word. Uh, so the big, thing, the big thing about this is that communication has to be a, a level playing field. Everybody has to use it. Uh, that's the problem with the physical companies and, and the, the virtual employees is there's different communication tools being used. If you have a level playing field in communication, uh, you're naturally going to have everybody tapped in to what's going on. They're going to have their finger on the pulse of of your organization. Um, this is Lullabot's seventh year as a company, and we've had, we're now at 35 people, and we've had five people leave Lullabot over the course of seven years. Um, I think that's because the job can go with you in a lot of ways. If you move, or if something comes up, and you need to uh, be at home more, uh, a virtual company, a distributed company, can support those types of transitions. Uh, in the last seven years, I lived in Iowa, uh, Oregon, Utah, and now Rhode Island. Uh, and it's, it's nice to be able to take your job with you. Uh, keep giving back, be able to say yes to the awesome projects, uh, always have room for more. Gratitude, deliberate communication, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about that. Uh, like attracts like, you know, be, be, look, for the, look for the people and support and continue to give people the kinds of things that they want to do and work on. You know, check in often uh, about is there anything you're doing that we don't know about yet? Uh, and what can we be doing to support you more? That's what I, <coughs> excuse me, that's what I mean by um, deliberate communication is you can't, it's not enough just to walk by somebody's cubicle and pat them on the back. Uh, and say how they're doing. You actually have to pick up the phone and make a concerted effort to, to have a conversation with them and, and ask those kinds of questions. So sometimes the, the, the clients uh, have uh, different views on distributed companies. It can be a tough sell. It used to be a really tough sell. Uh, and we would say, you know, our work lives in the cloud and so do we. <laughs> That's um, gotten a little bit cornier over the years, so we, we say it less. But, uh, um, you know, one thing to understand is that corporate cultures usually come from uh, and, and failed experiment, experiments with telecommuting uh, or, uh, you know, telecommuting happened when there wasn't technology there to really support it, right? Those, these tools for collaboration are constantly changing and they've only gotten better. And I think it's important to empathize that a physical company 
has different ways of getting work done, uh, and there will be some give and take in the relationship. So, for instance, kick off a project on site, uh, get together, maybe even get together for the, for the milestones or work together for a week or two. Build up that trust, build up that collaboration, and then say, hey, you know, we've got some tools here that I think would be really helpful for this project. Maybe you spin off your own IRC channel uh, for that particular team with a client and try to do a, a little bit of cross-pollination uh, on the tools uh, to have a really successful project. So I think that looks like, looks like a real company to me. The, the remaining myths are a lot about communication. Um, communication in a distributed company tends to be open in nature. It tends to be proactive, deliberate, uh, and emotional. What do I mean by some of those things? So explicit communication. Um, you know, m management isn't a natural role to me. I don't feel like I was born to be a manager uh, in the same way that um, perhaps one doesn't feel ready to be a mother or a father, that there's some learned skills that go along with it. Uh, however, I think anybody that has kids also tends to be really good managers. There's some <laughs> relationships there. Uh, and um, you need to teach these things. You need to, to um, you know, have, again, culture is a byproduct of consistent behavior. And so outlining what you want those behaviors to be, either in a handbook uh, or just through repeated patterns, is really, really important. Um, be deliberate. Say what you need. Ask for help. Be your own model for accountability. If you mess up, say you mess up. Um, own it and let people know that it's okay to own those mistakes. Um, on the emotional side, you know, we encourage venting. We don't always know how people feel or, or, or what's going on, but sometimes on our calls we'll hear um, some frustration or they're down. And what we'll do is we'll, you know, our managers or, or us will give them a call and say, hey, what's going on? It sounds like you're having, sounds like you're having a tough day. Um, and giving room to vent, um, because if they don't vent now, is it gonna, are they gonna vent with a client? Are they gonna become more discouraged uh, and isolate themselves from the group? You know, staying on top of those things and being aware uh, of the cues, the, the things to listen for, the, the phrases to be aware of uh, is, is really important in a distributed company when you don't have those otherwise um, uh, nonverbal tools uh, available to you. Uh, also, support passion, support disagreement. Uh, you know, those are all healthy things. I, I, you know, a, a lot of people have a, a fear of conflict. I, I myself do, but I'm learning to embrace it more. Uh, um, you know, we spend time talking about nonviolent communication techniques, and we realize that we're all trying to get to the same goal uh, and creating the freedom to do that. Certainly, all the collaboration tools out there make it a lot easier, right? Opening up a Google Doc having 20 people contribute to it, come up with uh, you know, the next funny name for our product uh, can be uh, really fun and rewarding and we really wanna foster that uh, and, and let people have an opinion and know that, that we've heard them. So let's look at some examples of communication overhead. Uh, communication is inefficient. So one of the things that we've gone back and forth with uh, is that we have two team calls a week the whole team, the entire team. Uh, it's, like, it's like having uh, an all hands on deck company meeting uh, on Mondays and Fridays. The only difference is that um, everybody, everybody gets, a, gets a turn to, to say what they're working on. Um, we've done the math, it's expensive. It's expensive to run, um, but it's so rewarding to do uh, on Monday to jump on the phone, everybody gets one to two minutes to talk. Yeah, we time it. Uh, and, and they say what their goals are for the week. Um, they say what they're working on and we give company updates. And then we do the same thing on Friday. How did your week go? What did you, what did you accomplish? And it's kind of like this power hour of conversation where everybody gets to say what they're doing. Um, it's great, it creates alignment. Uh, it, it, everybody knows what each other's working on. And I think these kinds of things are really important to stay tapped in uh, because you're not going to see everybody, to every, everybody uh, in the office each day. Uh, so, you know, this model might change. Is it inefficient? I don't think so. Is it sustainable? Probably not in its current form. Uh, we've got some ideas um, on, on how to do it, but having a touch point 
uh, for the whole organization, I think, is really important for a distributed company. Um, we do weekly written management reports uh, for all of these, all of these categories. It, it might be tedious. I don't think it's a lot different from a physical company. Um, I think uh, uh, it's great. It gives the uh, individuals time to reflect on how their department or, or how their department or area did, uh, and then it gives us time um, to read them and then offer some thoughtful feedback and support for the week to come. And I think I think I've said this, but to be explicit, the secret advantage I feel of an entirely distributed company is that everyone has to use the same tools to communicate. Um, I have a little typo there, but I apologize for that. Uh, so it's a powerful concept, right? To be able to reach into your pocket, pull out your phone, and use a tool like Yammer and know exactly what people are doing, where they're going, how they communicate. The funny thing is, is things like that actually come in handy for uh, the physical being together in, in the same area too. Uh, so Yammer has this feature where it can send SMS messages to, to a group. So we use it here, everybody gets a text message because most of the team is here, and we can say, you know, we're going out to dinner here, this is the person that's manning the booth right now. So it has some, some really nice adjacent effects too, um, uh, unifying on the communication tools. Um, the interesting thing is, is that you use the same tools to communicate, but you can also have, um, rather than broadcasting, you can also have private conversations a little bit easier too. Uh, so you can ping someone in IRC, you can, you can call them on the phone, and not everybody's in the office watching, watching who walks into the, to the room with the boss and gets the door and, and has the door closed to have a private conversation. They, everybody starts to wonder what's going on and, and all that sort of stuff. So I think there's, you know, it works kind of both ways. Um, you have less, uh, uh, less politics in the office as well. So is it inefficient? Um, I don't think so. There's, there's a, you know, it's, it's different. It's less spoken and it's more, it's more written kind of communication. Uh, it's more of a documentation culture. Um, but I think there is a kind of cadence to a distributed company. Again, that social network concept of everybody's going in the same direction once you get the communication tools figured out. Um, you know, I, uh, it's not inefficient, um, but I didn't know if we could scale it past 10 people. I didn't know if we could scale it past 20 people. I didn't know if we could scale it past 30 people. The tools have changed a little bit. We're using more video. Uh, we're using um, more microblogging rather than intranets, but uh, the, I definitely see the, see the rewards there. Um, yep. So uh, the top five virtual company myths, no teamwork. Um, yeah, these are some of the communication tools that we use. I'm not gonna go into detail uh, for all of them, um, but uh, none of them should look too unfamiliar to this crowd in particular. Um, Etherpad, like I said, is a, is a Google Doc light kind of thing. We use that for more quickly brainstorming and we use Google Docs for more formatting kinds of things. Um, I will talk about a, a couple of these in particular to, to highlight the team aspect. Um, IRC, it's the office, the water cooler and all. Uh, share the funny YouTube videos, um, reach out to people during the day. If you're in IRC, that means that you're at work, that means you're available uh, to have a conversation. Um, it's, it's no frills, right? It's low key. Unlike Skype, uh, it's private. If you do Skype chat, your friends can ping you at any time. And this is reserved more just for uh, the office, just for getting, getting your work done. Um, the ping pong culture means more flow, right? Someone says, hey, are you available? You can say, yes, I am. No, I'm not. Uh, it's more uninterrupted time to get work done, and, and we really like that. Um, sometimes, you know, like any other company, uh, people get overbooked. Uh, and, you know, we try to monitor that, we try to regulate that, uh, but having those uninterrupted times to get work done or to collaborate with your, with your team, I think is much more easily accomplished in a, in a distributed company. And IRC is great. I mean, the reward is seeing everybody work to jump into the room and say, holy crap, there's, there's the whole office. On-site, um, 
you know, it's, I, would, I don't know if I'd call it a tool, but it's really important to get together sometimes just to get together, to do meetups of smaller groups and smaller departments, uh, or to do larger company retreats where you just get time to chill out and relax with each other. Um, we also, because we don't see each other uh, uh, all the time, um, we do funny things like when we're setting up the booth uh, for DrupalCon, we run around with funny capes and masks uh, just because we can. So other tools. Um, again, a, a lot of these are familiar. Dropbox is our file sharing. Trip it's for, for traveling. We use Drupalize Me a lot for onboarding um, new people that aren't familiar with Drupal. So that's a good way to get them up to speed. Uh, we have a tech stipend, so rather than buying everybody's equipment, we just give, um, we actually, <laughs> We give people um, a credit card, uh, or more like a debit card, uh, and put a monthly stipend on there for people to buy uh, and save up their equipment uh, for laptop purchases and that sort of stuff. Uh, we don't have any interest in owning their equipment, and everybody has different preferences on the types of tools and technologies and applications that they want to buy to get their work done. We use Let's Freckle for um, uh, hourly saying what you're working on and using that to build back time for clients when we work on hourly projects. Uh, we have what we call the Lullabot Field Guide, which is, I think nowadays, uh, we just wrapped it up. It's about a 75-page manual, mostly talking about communication, how to email, how to use IRC, um, what to, what, you know, how to get into the flow of conversations and collaborations and that sort of stuff. Uh, Lockify, Lockify is for secure file transfers, and TurboBridge is our conference line system. So we have 10 conference lines that we use for all sorts of different things, um, internal, private conference lines, and then external, uh, client-facing conference lines that we use. So, yeah, there's a lot of teamwork going on. Lonely job? Yeah, it can be. It's not for everyone. If, if you're coming from and spend a lot of time in the cubicle lifestyle, it is, it is a difficult adjustment. And we, we try really hard to um, support uh, and help uh, and, and mentor uh, new people as they, as they come, aboard, come aboard. Um, it's easy to burn out or fall into a black hole when you're, when you're left on your own for too long. Um, for me, I find travel helps with that uh, and, and getting together with a team. Um, I think this is where the social network aspect of a company comes in handy. You have peer support. Uh, you have, uh, we encourage the team to be stewards of good communication and to reach out to people. Um, again, that's what most of our handbook uh, is dedicated to. Um, to. To combat loneliness, uh, one, of the things, one of the things that we do from a culture perspective is we say, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, you know, did it, did it happen? Um, meaning we need to know, we, we need to, we embrace proactive communication because that's, that's vital to the organization. We don't have the other nonverbal cues um, that physical companies would otherwise have. Um, Co-working is good. Uh, sometimes uh, we, will, we will work together just for the sake of working together because it's been a while. Uh, working from a coffee shop, uh, fly or drive to go visit uh, another team member, go for a run. Uh, go do something else, switch up the gears. Um, I think, I think in, some, in some instances you'll hit extremes. I know that I oscillate back and forth a little bit. Um, sometimes I'll work too much uh, or too little because I don't know what I should be doing. Um, and so that's, that's a form of, of isolation. Or I don't know where to start or begin because I'm overwhelmed. Uh, and um, taking a step back, syncing up with other people uh, and saying, hey, I need a little bit of direction, or just even uh, finding some time or some ways to get together can really uh, help clarify things. Uh, and again, that social background, you know, having um, something else beyond work, you know, ho hobbies. Okay. What's that? Th 10 minutes to go. Thank you. That's, that's what my clock says, too. Thanks. So let me, let me wrap it up. Sometimes it can be lonely. Uh, we've, talked, we've talked about, is it sustainable? I don't know. Um, I think we have a way to go. Automatic, 150 distributed employees, MySQL, um, now Oracle, uh, 450 distributed employees. Uh, there's some, some really good presentations out there on the net from the MySQL folks uh, about how they run their virtual organization. It's very, very much the same, I think. Um, sustainable. I, I'm reminded of this quote by Eric Ries. Uh, in his book, Lessons Learned, he says, 
Values are the foot you leave on the floor when you pivot. Uh, how will we know when it's no longer sustainable? Uh, when we can no longer leave our foot on the floor. And that's the only unit of measure that I, that I have for that. Um, I'm really excited to, to cross that bridge, though, uh, and get to that point. So uh, at least in a physical company, uh, oops, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, not a real, so the, the myth, so not a real company, I think that's a myth. Communication is inefficient, I think that's a myth. No teamwork, I think that's a myth. Lonely jobs, sometimes it can be. Sustainable, maybe. So at least you don't have to worry about, in a distributed company, someone eating your lunch, your car being dinged in the parking lot, awkward bathroom moments. <laughs> However, I will say, uh, it's still possible to have awkward bathroom moments. Remember the mute button on your phone. Uh, but as a distributed company, you may not be able to get help on a project without asking for it. Uh, you may uh, not be able to meet in person every, every day with your team uh, or not always have the gumption to be self-driven. So I want to tie this back into the beginning. This is my last slide. Um, my first experience at a distributed team uh, and healthy social network was Drupal. Uh, I came in. Uh, Dries was warm, friendly, inviting, as well as the other 30 people working on the project at the time. That really made me feel welcomed, and I felt welcomed in the community since 2003. So that was the tipping point. That was the point for saying, you know, something like a distributed company is possible. It can be achieved. So uh, let's continue to make Drupal open uh, and accessible uh, way beyond the source code. Let's do it for the people, too. Um, it's, it's how great things happen. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions? Yep, and use the microphone there. They tell me it's being recorded. Sure. Um, so what about the uh, scheduling, planning, and setting and meeting customers' expectations? Do you find some yep. specifics there? Setting, planning, meeting. We've, we've tried a couple things. The, the, the handiest thing we've used is Google Calendar, Google for Business. Um, uh, I don't want to be an advertisement for Google, but they've got some good things going on. Uh, and we allow read-only access to everybody's work calendar so we can see and collaborate that way. For each of our 10 conference lines, uh, we have corresponding calendars. Uh, we have a conference call calendar that people book time and reserve time, so everybody learns to check that beforehand. Uh, for outbound scheduling kinds of things, uh, we've used Tungle, tungle.me, uh, to try and connect and collaborate, because there's a lot of emails that go back and forth. Can you make it this time? Can you make it this time? No, I can't, but I can do it the next. And so we, we tend to uh, outsource that, if you will, to Tungle. Um, so that everybody can go and see who's available when and it comes in pretty handy for that. What's the setting for then? Project scheduling. Project scheduling. Uh, uh, so in terms of... Uh, um, uh, just, just the fact that, um, you know, when you're... I, I've done a lot of managing of, of distributed um, groups and managing people's um, time and commitments and then setting customers' expectations yep. and then meeting those expectations bring some specific challenges of worrying how you guys uh, approach it. Yep, definitely. Uh, so in terms of um, project scheduling, management, management, all of that, uh, again, it's tapping into the social network aspect of your company, being visible, remaining visible, learning to virtually raise your hand when you need help, uh, knowing that if you know, a, a good interview question is, if you spend, you know, say you've spent three days on this bug that you can't resolve, what do you do, right? And you say, well, I just, I start kicking the wall, and then I Google it, and then, you know, it's like, no, you ask for help. And to have that be embedded in your culture helps keep the project uh, on track. So that's one of the, one of the ways. Yeah. In the, uh, well, in the um, early stages of, of starting Lullabot, how did you overcome the, um, stigma from clients thinking that you weren't a real company and how did you um, obviously you guys ended up getting offices so that was obviously something that you tried to do to help alleviate that but before you got offices what did you do as far as meeting with clients and you know what were you, some of your answers or responses yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, the offices came about because we thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to have a yoga studio? <laughs> and so it was kind of less, less about the clients. Um, but yeah, we did, we did hit, that, hit that obstacle, and we found that um, taking the first step, taking the first initiative to actually go out and meet them, uh, rather than sort of waiting for that conversation to happen, kind of being proactive about it, showed, okay, these are real people doing real things. And any time that we did uh, an education event, a, a workshop, or we were going to go to a conference, or we were going to do our, do our conference, um, we would invite the clients. We would invite them out to kind of to meet everybody, to see everybody. So any time we had a, a group kind of thing, if we could bring clients into it one way or another, it showed, hey, look, we're real people getting real things done. The other thing that we would do um, is at some point you, you reach a point where you can say, you know, don't take our word for it. Talk to, let me give you the name of, of the, the last project that we did, the person that we worked for, and talk to them and see uh, if he felt, uh, you know, see, if, see what their experience was. And so, you know, often having your other clients be spokespeople for you can go a long ways to, to alleviate the, the uncomfortableness. You had mentioned a field guide that was a 75-page manual. Do you have any tips or any books that you could recommend for a company that's doing that? My company is right now going through that through a results-only work environment. And um, we have several people who have given us some insight, but do you have any? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a Lullabot book club. Uh, again, it's just a group on Yammer that everybody says, hey, I read this book, and it's kind of awesome. Um, there's, there's a number of books. There's a, there's a book called Small Giants, which is by, I think, Bo Burlingham, Earl Burlingham, some Bobby, Bobby B, somebody, Burlingham, uh, and it's talking about how companies choose to um, be great instead of good and what that difference is. So it's sort of a cultural alignment that I think is really good for uh, distributed companies, remote, remote companies. Um, we're in, in Lullaby right now, we're reading a book called Tribal Leadership, uh, which is really a, an interesting one about uh, um, again, moving from that I space to the we space and breaking, having little tribes into the, the larger groups, that's a good one. Another one that I, fit, that I just read was The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and it kind of reads like a story, and it talks about um, fear of conflict and communication and building a culture of openness and trust in the organization, it's, and it's in story form. Doesn't make for a very good audio book if you're into that, but it's, it's, a, better, it's a better book to, to read. Um, but that's a, that's a good one, too. Can you say the last one again? Which one did I just say? The five, the five dysfunctions of a team. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, Matt. Uh, hey. Quick question. Do you hire more junior developers? And if so, how do you integrate them into the distributed culture? Yeah, um, junior developers and, and how, do you, how do you bring them on? The, the onboarding process is really important in a distributed company. Um, imagine someone coming in in a distributed company. They get up in the morning. They know they're going to go work for, you know, for your organization. They're taking a shower. They're getting dressed. And they go to their computer. They sit there. You know, they open their laptop. They sit down and go, now what? <laughs> now what the hell do I do? Um, so we try to use the buddy system. So we give, we give uh, um, each new person a, a buddy. In this case, they're, they're distributed. They're in another uh, location. Um, sometimes we come on site. Uh, so we've been toying around with the idea that if we hire two or three um, you know, junior developers, for instance, that we would fly them all to um, a central location and spend time and work with them for a week. You know, we have this office space that we really only use for meetups uh, or for bringing the team in and doing some work together. Um, but, uh, but that's good. You know, having resources like Drupalize Me kind of helps with that. But definitely um, orienting them on the first day and giving them someone to talk to that's not their boss, that is their, you know, side-by-side um, -side, uh, person that, they'll, that they can work along with uh, is really empowering for them to get them what they need. But we, there's a lot of reading that first day, that, that handbook and, and knowing what's expected of them and that sort of stuff. In your opinion, has your innovative use of social networking and, and global team building diminished the need for a tra traditional project management function uh, or eliminated that, the need for that function? Yeah, so what's the role of traditional project management in a distributed company and distributed teams? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I don't know if I have a, a, a definitive 
answer for that. So uh, there's a lot of different types of project management, and we've seen different types in, in different organizations. Um, you know, there's, there's project management that is, uh, is more like cat herding and, and pushing things along. And then there's, you know, uh, again, the, the, the role of, of management, I think, in a distributed company is to motivate, to empower, to facilitate, to make sure that projects are flowing, um, unstuck. And uh, I think it, it more becomes that and uh, acting you know, we find project management as a role uh, to interface with the client, as a role to move things along. We have a, we usually do a daily 15-minute uh, call that we invite the client to to say, what are you working on? Um, are you stuck? What do you, what do you need to move forward? Um, and I think the traditional project management is more about filing reports. And in this case, I don't mean to sound, I don't mean to overstate it, but the reports kind of file themselves. You know, uh, you're, you've already created that culture where everybody is documenting, writing, sharing, bubbling up. Um, someone's taking notes on each of the scrum calls. The clients are already on there. Uh, and um, it just becomes less about that and more about facilitating the actual work. Uh, I think this follows up on that, <coughs> on that question. This, yeah, this is the last question. Uh, do you use any sort of issue tracking or bug tracking systems? Yeah, we use a lot. I don't know what the... Uh, Sally, what's our favorite one these days? Assembla? All right, Assembla. Uh, there's a, we use a whole bunch, and it's, um, sometimes it's what the client prefers, and, and we, we have our preferences too. But we've used Unfuddle for a number of years, uh, and it looks like all the kids are on the Assembla bandwagon these days. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.